That's far. It's Lord, I ask that uh, you make my lesson clear today, that uh, it has energy and <coughs> clarity. Uh, we ask also that uh, the words are understood by the folks who are here today, and they are meaningful in their own walk. Uh, please bless those who are not with us today, and uh, be here amongst us as we continue the study of your word. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, so far we've covered the first two Beatitudes. The blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn. Uh, today we're going to look at the next two and we'll watch uh, Dr. Curtis's video. Um, and I'll remind the folks at home who watch our lesson on YouTube. I'll pause the. I'll pause my lesson periodically through the morning and uh, allow you time to go to the link that's on the church website where you can watch the next uh, discussion about Beatitudes by Dr. Curtis. So we're going to talk this morning about blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And we're going to take this in two parts. One is, what or who are the meek, and why or how can they inherit the earth? Um, anybody got a, a perception about what it means if you're meek? I always thought my dad fit that. Uh, I guess it was, for some reason, it was because he was diminutive, you know, he, he was only about 5'4", I think. Never weighed more than 120 pounds in his life. Would it be correct to think humble and poor? Humble is a, is a great synonym for meek. Um, okay. But I don't picture my dad or anybody else who I described as, the, what's the phrase? Meek as a lamb? That kind of senses weakness, right? And the dictionary defines meek as mild of temper or patient under injuries or duress, which I think better fits my dad. But really meek is something more. Um, in your own mind, would you think Moses to be a meek man? Remember, he had a temper. That's why he didn't get a chance to cross the Jordan into Canaan. Um, he I led... Got, I got a question. Yeah. Was that because he didn't cross the Jordan into Canaan? Was right. That from God ordering him not to? Yes, because okay. uh, at one point he gave, God gave Moses instructions on how to bring water out of a rock and Moses got so angry that he failed to follow God's instruction on how to do that, and as a consequence, God said, "Well, I'm sorry, you're not you're not going to go into the land of Canaan." So he 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 was uh, he, he was impatient. He uh, had a temper. Uh, he took a rebellious crowd uh, forty years through the desert, through a trackless wilderness and eventually united this dispirited group to be a, a nation of God. And so this morning, I'm going to go to a reference. I'm using a King James Version because oftentimes in the other translations, they translate meek as humble, which is a good translation, but I don't think it adequately captured. So I'm reading out of the King James Version, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. It says this about Moses. Says now the man Moses was very meek above all the men who were upon the face of the earth. How about Jesus? Was he meek? Remember, he stood up to the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. At Nazareth, you remember he preached to his hometown crowd, and uh, they got angry and they kind of uh, stood up and were going to harm him when he just pushed his way through the crowd. He uh, endured a uh, sham court trial with dignity and 
courage. And he certainly was courageous during crucifixion because what was the, one of the first things he did while he was suffering on the cross was forgave the people who had put him there. Uh, Matthew 11, verse uh, 28, uh, Christ describes himself with the following words. Come unto me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest into your so unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You remember those words because we're going to talk about that in a minute too. Uh, the Greek word for meek is praus, P-R-A-U-S. Which could be, it's kind of an interesting word. It could be defined as a middle ground between excessive anger and excessive angerlessness. <laughs> Get the picture? In other words, it's a man who gets angry, or a woman who gets angry at the right time and doesn't get angry at the wrong time. I don't know how many of us can say that uh, we meet those criteria. Usually, we lose control when we shouldn't and get angry at things, and oftentimes we're kind of complacent when we should be angry at things that happen. Now, anger is not always bad. Teachers get angry at ignorance because they want kids to learn. Uh, doctors get angry at illness because they want people to be well. Um, Christians get, should be angry about sin. Prius can also be used to describe an animal that's been domesticated, like a workhorse. Think of a Clydesdale. We've all seen the, the advertisements on TV with Clydesdale pulling those big wagons, right? Uh, they are powerful, right? Those big muscular horses are powerful, but they're subject to the control of their owners. Another example for the word meek in Greek would be the still water behind a dam. Once you put that water through hydroelectric turbines, it generates lots of power. So meek in Greek really kind of defines power under control. Now in the Bible, meekness is an attitude or a quality of heart of a person who is willing to accept and submit without resistance to the will and desire of God. And that, I think, is my dad. The meek are not impressed with their own achievements. Uh, that's why humble works, as Steve said. Uh, they are confident, knowing who they are. They're sure enough of their power that they have no compulsion to demonstrate it. And their strength is under the control of the Holy Spirit. So a little bit different, perhaps, than what we picture as meek. Um, so what does it mean to say the meek inherit the earth? Well, it has little to do with power, position, money, and has everything to do with what's inside the person. Uh, meek people inherit friends, peace of mind. They're sure of their own abilities because their passions are under control and they don't waste a lot of energy. Meekness is power under control. And that's why the symbol of a yoke is pretty appropriate. And that came from the verse that I just read, right? Christ said, take my yoke. Um, are we willing to yoke ourselves? Everybody knows what a yoke is, right? It's the wooden... Typically, I think of it as those wooden collars that oxen wear. Are we willing to yoke ourselves to the Lord? Remember, the folks in Jesus' day were yoked to the law. It was hard. 
Can you imagine to be thought a good person, you had to follow all the 613 laws laid out by uh, the Ten Commandments and the religious leaders at the time. That means you couldn't work on Sunday. You could walk to the synagogue if it was within a certain distance. Um, you couldn't have leavened bread during certain festivals. Men had to make three trips to Jerusalem during the year uh, to attend the festivals. I mean, there were just so many laws. I mean, you couldn't cook your food in milk. You couldn't eat shellfish. I mean, you think about all the laws. They had to pray. They had to attend synagogue. They had to provide sacrifices. They had to buy pigeons or lambs or whatever it was that they needed for the sacrifice. I mean, can you imagine? I, I, I think it would just be hard. You would just get tired of trying to do all those things over and over again. It required you to be yoked to the law. And so they got tired struggling with it. Now, Jesus called his yoke easy because he would free them from their burdensome toils. He would free them from the requirement to follow the law. And ultimately, he freed them from, and us, from sin because he died on the cross. So when, I think we Christians sometimes think that it's hard to be a Christian. When, when you first became a Christian, probably the thing that you thought about, at least the thing that I thought about was, gee, I have to follow all those laws, right? I have to be a good person. I have to do all of those things. I have to go to church. I have to do this. I have to tithe. I have to do all those things. That's not what being a Christian is all about. What being a Christian is all about is accepting Christ and having faith in what God has promised. And if you really do that, then you will want to do all those other things. So it's not that to be a Christian you have to do these things. The yoke that Christ laid upon us is to accept him. And once we do that, in our walk of faith, as we get more mature, we will want to do more things that exemplify what we, what we truly believe. So if our cancer or other life's challenges causes us anxiety or hopelessness, if we can become meek, humble ourselves to learn and submit to Christ, then he will take our burdens and give us strength. So in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, we find strength. And uh, I think my favorite, one of my favorite Bible verses, actually my favorite is Psalms 107, but one of the favorite ones is Isaiah 40. Um, when I went on the walk to Emmaus, this was my table group. Some of you haven't been to Emmaus, that won't mean much, but everybody sits with a group. And as a group, you come up with a way to name your table. And typically it's out of the scriptures. And uh, my table group's name was On Eagle's Wings. And it comes from Isaiah 40, starting at verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth, 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 <laughs> I'm not sure that's the word, Y-O-U-T-H-S, youth I think is per word grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who have hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on, e on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And I, was it Casting Crowns or Mercy Me? No, had a song, right? Casting yeah. Crowns, yeah. So in 
the strength of the Lord, we have power. And, and so we are meek. I'm going to pause my lesson right here for right now, and those at home can click on the link. I think it starts around time 29 on that little over an hour video. And so we'll stop here, show that portion of the video, and then we'll come back. Okay, we're back. Um, the next beatitude is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Um, I thought long and hard about this. Hopefully... <laughs> I'm not sure I'm clear in my mind what this means, uh, to be honest. Um, I'm pretty sure people around the table here have never really been hungry or thirsty. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we probably have a desire to eat, but I think when Christ is saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, He's talking about real hunger and real thirst. Now, now babies get hungry, right? We know they get hungry when they start crying. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that we can all agree that the people of Gaza right now are hungry and thirsty. Um, but for us, I'm not sure that most in the United States, and I'm not trying to say that there aren't people who do hunger and do thirst and do go to bed hungry. There are, and there are in our own neighborhoods, I'm sure of that. But me personally, I've never felt that kind of hunger or that kind of thirst. So it's a little difficult for me to really, I can understand what Christ was saying. I can understand how hunger and thirst is meant in this particular passage. But Physically and, you know, emotionally, I don't really know what that means. Uh, there was a parable in the Bible about a man who went out and hired workers. He hired a bunch in the morning, then he hired a couple, a couple hours later, and he kept hiring them until late in the day. And then he paid everybody that evening, right? Did it ever question why they paid in the evening? Well, because people in Jesus' day oftentimes lived day to day. And if they didn't have food at night, they wouldn't have, if they didn't have money at night, they wouldn't have money to buy food for the next day. And so when Christ told those listening, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they understood hunger and thirst. Um, so maybe we haven't, experience true physical hunger and thirst but perhaps we've hungered for knowledge mm -hmm. or as a parent sometimes you hunger for peace from a crying baby <laughs> right getting up at night um, or maybe you've hungered to be free from the stress of cancer like doctor uh, on the show um, or I you know neither nobody in our family uh, except for Kim had to go undergo chemo um, and frequent visits. And I, and I know since I took her most of the time, I could see after, you know, a year or two, and, and some people fight cancer for years, eight or nine years. So I can see how they may hunger to just be relieved of the tedium of struggling with chemo chemotherapy or struggling to go to a doctor on a periodic basis or struggling with the emotion that, you know, nothing changed, the tumor doesn't go away or, and it doesn't have to be cancer. It can be any life threatening situation. Righteousness. What is righteousness? If you look at a definition in the, in the dictionary, it says morally right. Um, so the question is, how many of you have hungered and thirst for righteousness? Uh, I, I think perhaps in some ways we probably don't understand what that word means. We often think of qualities like faith 
or hope, but I think Christ meant something a little bit larger when he talked about hunger and thirsting for righteousness. Uh, you remember from the scriptures, Matthew 5, 20, a couple, I guess it was last week, we read um, that Christ told the crowd they needed to be more righteous than the Pharisees, right, who publicly displayed fasting and talking about how they prayed in public and, and gave at the temple. Uh, he said, in order to be righteous, you had to be more righteous than the Pharisee. Well, oh, can I, can I answer yes. That? So my whole life, um, that right there, I thought that I was doomed because I couldn't outdo the Pharisees. And when I was <laughs> home in New York, I had it on family life because there's no K-Love. And there's this guy that started talking that I like to listen to. I don't know his name. And he talked about just that. And for the first time in my life, I see where I am out doing the Pharisees. <laughs> Not to jump ahead of you, because you're probably going to say this, but he came out and said that the Pharisees did not preach with their hearts. They were just all show. So you do a little bit of your heart for, for Jesus and, and serve him like the Pharisees, and you already outdid them. And I was like, I, I felt like, Screaming hallelujah. <laughs> I was like, I gotta shout. <laughs> and, and then there's a question about are you talking about personal righteousness or are you talking about social righteousness? So uh, I want to look at the Greek language again. Um, the word righteous. Now, Greek verbs can be genitive or accusative case. So hunger and thirsting in a genitive case means that we would thirst for a drink of water, but we wouldn't drink all the water in the container. Accusative case, you would thirst for water, but you would drink all the water in the container. And so Jesus is talking in the accusative taste, in the accusative case. So what he's saying is you need to hunger and thirst for total righteousness. Now I can give you some extremes. For example, there are people, uh, Christians, who are very personally faithful, but they don't engage in any social activities. So they go to church every day. In fact, uh, John wrote uh, to the seven churches in Revelations, and one of the churches he wrote to, he said, hey, you guys are really faithful, but you've closed yourself off from the rest of of your community. Uh, so what kind of a what kind of a faith do you have? Yeah, you're very religious and you're very but you you don't spread that understanding to people around you. On the other hand, we can picture somebody who's very emotional and very taken up with social causes, whether it be climate or hunger or whatever the case may be, but they they have no personal faith. They're acting on their own volition. Well, what Christ is saying, we need to hunger and thirst for total righteousness, not just, as I have, have given you an example, not just personal faith and not social understanding and not just social understanding and not personal faith. So how does Jesus expect us to be satisfied? Um, everybody knows who Mother Teresa is, right? Uh, she labored for years in the slums of India, trying to make people's lives better, who lived in poverty, had uh, no uh, medical facilities, education, whatever. Now, if... Um, if Mother Teresa's whole life was based on meeting and getting success, she would have been a complete failure. How many in here think that her life was a failure? I certainly don't. So she must have known the whole time she was there that she could never eradicate poverty in India. But yet we think that she was successful, right? So Jesus did not say, blessed are those who become righteousness. He said, this, bad, this, this beatitude reflects something different. 
This beatitude reflects the grace of God. We are judged, listen to this, we are judged by our in intention and not by our achievements. It is not our hungering and thirsting that win the praise of God. It's not it's not our accomplishments. It is the fact that we hunger and thirst for righteousness. It is the fact that we use our faith to move in that direction. It is good that we want to do that. I hear the pastor say it all the time. He said, the first step is to want to do something, right? And once we want to do something, then we gradually engage in that something and over a period of time, we become more mature and more Christ-like. So Christ does not. I mean, the whole story of being a disciple for Christ and telling others about Christ, it's not a success. Christ does not expect us to win that person to Christ. That's not, that's not what he expects. What he expects is that we at least bring our story and our testimony to others. It's, it's spreading the seed. It's not growing the crops. We spread the seed. We do those things, and God will grow the plants. So when we say hunger and thirst for righteousness, what he's saying is we need to act. We need to uh, try to achieve that goal and if we achieve success that's terrific if we don't that's okay too um, we may look at the inadequacies of our own personal lives and be frustrated or even ashamed and then we look at the effort and the investment we make and we see little ground being gained either in our personal righteousness or in our social righteousness. Now, it could be um, the impact of our, on our lives that cancer causes or other life's challenges uh, may leave us with a feeling that uh, we're not making any progress. But when Jesus says, hunger and thirst for righteousness, what he is asking us to do is to Make the try. Get out there and do the things that, um, just like Mother Teresa, spent her whole life trying to erase poverty in, in India. And what she did was she spread the love of Christ in the process, and she met that hunger and thirst. How happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? Um when they're trying to achieve total life encompassing righteousness, they will be happy. We will be happy. When people make the attempt to live in righteousness, then they're really living at the heart of the matter and they will be satisfied. I'm gonna pause again and we'll pick up the last section and then I'll close after the video. Okay, so we're back again. I hope uh, the folks at home are uh, watching the video. Uh, let me see if I can draw some conclusions. Um, for those of us who feel weak or depleted, um, either from life's challenges, whether it be cancer or some other illness or uh, a bad relationship or loss of job or financial difficulties, uh, we need to turn this weakness into meekness. It's a state of willing dependence upon God. And I think we've talked about this before. Sometimes we don't realize how blessed we are until we're at the bottom of that valley. Hold on to the promises of God and allow them to strengthen you. So be strong in weakness. Be strong in and be meek. I thought uh, his uh, description of righteousness 
that this beatitude is not for the people who think they are righteous, but it's for the people who know they are not. And he wants, Christ wants those folks to hunger and thirst for righteousness in the same way that you would hunger and thirst physically. So you consider your own situation and embrace your personal hunger for knowing more about God. One of the reasons why you're here in Sunday school is to learn more and to feed that hunger and thirst. So as we all travel this path, it's enough to want to change as the first step. And as our hearts slowly align to God's purpose in our lives, as we slowly achieve greater understanding of righteousness, then our need for meaning and fulfillment will be met. And I think that if you've come through a very serious valley, a very serious season in your life, and you've come out on top and recognized what belief and your faith can do for you in that particular situation, then you've really achieved the blessing that God has provided for you. Um, next Sunday, we'll pick up the next two, and then the following Sunday, two more, and after that, I'm still, I've got an idea, but I'm still thinking about where we'll go. I, I think we may go back into a Bible study. And uh, I'm looking at the book of Mark as a potential. Uh, let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you for being here this morning. Touch our hearts. Take the words of the lesson and um, think about them. Uh, study them. Apply them to our own faith. Please be with uh, those who are not here today and guide each and every one of us through the next week and bring us back safely next Sunday. In thy name we pray.